the second part of our study in the book of Matthew this is what I've chosen to call the platform for the king. In politics, whether here in America or overseas, what a person holds, what they believe, their views on special issues is often called the party platform. The platform of the king is recorded in what is known as the Sermon on the Mount. The Sermon on the Mount was given to clarify the true nature of righteousness and to challenge for its proper application to life by those who would rightly relate themselves to the king in anticipation of the coming kingdom. Jesus used the Beatitudes and two metaphors of influence to teach the principles of righteousness as the blessed way of life for those who would follow their king. The Beatitudes are eight statements of blessing that is promised to those who have the right attitude before God, such as blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. It closes with one much more convicting, and that is, blessed are you when uh, you are persecuted and you suffer all manner of evil for my sake, Jesus said. That's blessing and rewards that are promised for those that have right attitudes and live right before God. Two metaphors of influence are used, salt and light. Salt as a preservative is necessary in a decaying world. Light as a means of illumination to truth about Jesus Christ is necessary in a darkened world. Jesus clarified the need for a heart righteousness in this sermon, not just hand ritual. This leads us to a question, for whom is this message intended, this Sermon on the Mount? Well, in chapter 5, verse 1 of the book of Matthew, he tells us that when he saw the multitudes, he went up on a mountain, and after he sat down, his disciples came to him. And opening his mouth, he began to teach them. What you'll find in this sermon is there is material there for those who have not yet trusted in Christ. And they're going to be invited to enter uh, into a way of life of following Jesus Christ. There is also instruction for those who have already decided to follow Christ, who are the light of the world, who can be the salt of the earth, and who do have the promises of blessing upon their life. In the next section of this sermon, Jesus clarifies the need for a heart righteousness rather than a hand ritual. It's not just enough to think that it's, if I keep the letter of the law, I'm okay. For Jesus uses six contrasts between statements that were made in the Old Testament and how they were interpreted in New Testament times and how he really wanted us to understand it. One illustration of these six, what I call gatekeepers of the heart, will suffice to illustrate what we mean. He says, do not murder. But then he says, but I tell you, everyone who is angry in his heart against his brother is already guilty before God. If the ultimate effect is murder, then the, the heart issue and the root issue is anger that needs to be dealt with. The way you deal with anger is make reconciliation. And that's the heart level solution to that problem. Each of the six illustrations of a contrast and comparison of Old Testament teaching in Jesus Jesus said, you've heard it say, but I say unto you, gets at that heart issue. He talks about three spheres of life. One is religious life. In religious life, he is arguing that it's not what you do before men that really counts. It's what you do before God. So in chapter 6 in verse 1, he says, beware of practicing your righteousness before men to be noticed by them. Otherwise, you have no reward with your Father who is in heaven. His three illustrations are the way we pray, the way we give, and the way we fast. Three religious practices that we could do so that others could see us. Uh, we make a motion of putting a big check in the offering basket. We, uh, we, we, we show people by our posture the way we are seeking to pray and the words we use for prayer. And sometimes the look on our face that we're in a terrible fast when God says, don't let anybody know. What you do in private is seen by the Father, and He'll reward you. That's the religious life. He then talks about resource life, the danger of worrying about what I don't have and the danger of trusting what I do have. And those two extremes are to be uh, dealt with before God at, at a heart level. What's too much? How will God take care of me when I think I have too little? 
but he also deals with the relational life. In the relational life, he says this, yeah, you need to treat others as you want them to treat you. Because if you treat others the way you want to be treated, you'll treat them well. And this fulfills the law and the prophets. Jesus captured so much of true biblical faith by that statement of how you live in right relationships with one another. The third section of this sermon is really the applicational section. Jesus uses illustrations to teach the priority that righteousness should have in the life of one who is in right relationship to the King, Jesus Christ. He uses two roads, two trees, two houses. Uh, two roads is an illustration that teaches the need to come to Christ regardless of who's traveling in the other direction. Come through a narrow gate and a narrow road that leads to eternal life. The two trees talks about two life characteristics, those who follow Christ and those who don't. By their fruits you will know them, he says. And finally he finishes with two houses. A house that's built without applying God's word to one's life and a house that's built upon the application of God's word. Two lives built on the word of God. The, the last illustration is two houses. And through the house built on the sand, he illustrates what it's like not to apply God's word to one's life. Destruction is the result. A house built on the rock is the illustration of hearing and doing the word of God. And that person has stability, even in times of testing. There's much in this sermon to apply to all of our lives, and we ought to do that.